Kundu. I'm a physician. My name is actually Dr. Kundu. I work in New Hampshire. Um, um, I'm board certified in internal medicine. I also do addiction medicine. Um, uh, and there are many other professionals like me uh, who are part of Calcutta Club. Uh, we are all very proud to present um, this event today. It's called um, Sanskriti, means uh, culture, culture of the nation, the heritage. And um, we do um, organize this every year, and it includes a book fair, so that you have a variety of um, Indian books. It does not necessarily has to be from Calcutta or Bengal. Um, we have books from many different regions all over the India, which uh, expresses and um, talks more about the inner culture, um, the thinking, thoughts, and feelings of the nation, you know? And how the different um, authors of the contemporary generation are changing the pattern of thinking and writing. So basically, um, every year in this book fair, we try to make sure we have books from different parts of the country, uh, different languages, um, and um, different kinds of thought process behind it. And um, this year is um, really very special uh, because uh, this year we are um, having a lar um, some part of the event uh, focused on women's liberation and women's freedom. So I'm very proud of Calcutta Club um, presenting this uh, event today. Um, and um, especially because of the event, um, I'm very proud of um, those women authors who are coming up front with uh, stories where women are bold enough to um, break the taboos of female sexuality and um, um, you know how to embrace womanhood and how women should be thinking forward and make their own individual presence in this uh, era of um, Indian uh, culture and atmosphere. Thank you. <laughs> so we would just like to know a little bit, you know, about you, your position in the community, and you know the importance of this book fair here today. Well, I'm not from this community. I'm visiting from India. That's great. That's and amazing. <laughs> so why are you here? What, what brings I'm you? I'm a here? writer, and uh, they wanted to hear from me. I've done this conference by Skype before a couple of years ago, but this year it so happened that I was addressing a conference in Washington just before their weekend. So when they said, "Could you come?" I said, "Why not? I'm in America anyway." And if you've undergone the jet lag to get here, you may as well take an extra day and see a new audience. And that's what I've come here to do. It's a very interesting initiative, I think, by um, Chetrom, you've just been speaking to and other people. What they've tried to do is instill an awareness of what's happening in the world of Indian culture, arts and letters um, amongst an expatriate community, which traces its origins to India, but which is obviously relatively out of touch because they live here, they work here, they probably have go back for holidays and stuff and some of them still have family members in India. But uh, to be actively involved with what's going on in the field of, uh, of culture, of writing, of ideas, that's not so easy when you're living in a foreign country, you know, half a world away. So um, this is why I thought it's worth encouraging this effort. So I'm just here, I'm going to be speaking at two o'clock and uh, then heading off the airport to fly back to India. Can you tell a little bit what are you going to be talking about today? Yes, I'm going to be talking about my new book, which is uh, out in India and Britain, but not yet out in the US, uh, which is about the British Empire in India. Uh, what they did over 200 years, they came to one of the richest countries in the world, and over 200 years of loot, pillage, and exploitation reduced it to one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, how they did that and, and all the arguments on all sides of this debate is what I'll be talking about. Half the book lays out the case, and the other half addresses the counter case. The fact is that a number of apologists for the British Empire have been arguing that whatever the truth may be of what they did, that basically they were good for India because they created, as the British see it, democracy, political unity, um, rule of law. They gave us the railways, the English language, the law courts, etc. And shouldn't we be grateful? This is broadly the, the theme and the somewhat more sophisticated version of this uh, is from the recent very popular best-selling historians like Niall Ferguson and, uh, and Lawrence James and Andrew Roberts who are arguing that the British Empire in India is what laid the foundations for India to take advantage of the globalization 
of the 21st century. Of course, it's an argument they only started making after India became prosperous again, but not, uh, not in the early days when <coughs> they had still left us reeling from their depredations. Now, so I'm going to briefly address both halves of the argument. Obviously, I can't cover everything in the time we have, but I'll be happy to take your questions so that anything of particular interest you can come to. So the first half of the argument is about the economic destruction and loot of India, and it's, it, it, you know, it occupies about half the book. I talk about the way in which the British first came as a trading company. Initially, for 100 years, that's all they were. They were traders. They had um, so-called factories, not because they manufactured anything, but because the traders were called factors, and where the factors lived and worked was called a factory, and they had them in a number of port towns with the consent of the local Rajas or the Mughal Emperor himself. And um, they were basically trying to make money through trade. But in the early 18th century, a political vacuum began in India. There was the gradual disintegration of the Mughal Empire, worsened by the raids on Delhi, first by another Shah in 1739, who looted the place so badly, killed so many people, and stole so much including the peacock throne and the fabled Kohinoor, that it is said that nobody in Persia had to pay any taxes for three years uh, because of how much loot they'd taken back from Delhi. And, um, and they never quite recovered from that. The Marathas, meanwhile, made significant inroads and controlled a large chunk of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, they reached up to Calcutta, where the so-called Maratha ditch dug by the British stopped them. In Delhi, they had kept the Mughal Emperor more or less as their own hostage, as their own prisoner, who they ruled nominally in his name, but he knew he had to do what they told him to do. But then the Marathas also took a body blow from the Afghans in the third battle of Bani in 1761, when Ahmad Shah Mali came and gave him a racket as well. So there was basically a vacuum of political authority in India, and the British moved in to take the space. Their charter allowed them to use force in the pursuit of commercial advantage. And obviously, it's far better to trade with a gun than without it, right? So if you don't want to buy what I'm selling you, or you don't want to sell me at my price what I want to take, and I have a gun and you don't, I generally get better in the transaction. And that's what the British East India Company did. So they, 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 they succeeded in spreading their political control gradually from what is usually taken as a seminal date as the 1757 Battle of Plassey, from then onwards, they continue spreading through. So by the first half of the 19th century, they controlled very much all of India, either directly under British rule or indirectly by uh, controlling the, uh, the remaining princes and potentates who ruled uh, in India uh, under, the, under the British thumb. So I describe all of this process and describe what they did while doing it. For example, India was, for 2,000 years, the world's leading exporter of textiles. With the world's leading manufacturer of cotton textiles, linen, muslin, and so on. And uh, you can go back to the Roman Empire and read the accounts of Pliny the Elder describing debates in the Roman Senate, in which Roman senators were complaining that half the gold in Rome was being sent off to India to indulge the tastes for cotton, linen, and other fine fabrics of their wives. Uh, this is actually recorded in. in in 2000 year old books, and this goes right up to, in fact, the 16th, 17th century. You can find in the literature accounts of English shopkeepers trying to pass off shoddy European made cloth as made in India because made in India was the hallmark of quality. All the aristocracy of Europe, whether in Versailles or in London, uh, seeking Indian cloth, Indian linens, Indian muslins uh, because these were the luxury fabrics of the era. And of course, places in Bengal were the leading capitals of, of cotton production, Dhaka and Mishinabad in particular. Um, the famous Dhaka horses, light as woven air, it was said, where you could pull a sari through a ring, so fine was the cloth. And um, so the British came in, they couldn't replicate that, they couldn't compete with it, so they destroyed it. They destroyed the, wool, the, the looms, they broke down the, the manufacturing areas, they dispersed the weavers. In at least one notorious incident recorded by a Dutch observer, they cut off the thumbs of the weavers so they couldn't weave again. And they started depopulating these towns. Mushidabad and Dhaka were the only cities 
in the beginning of the 19th century that actually lost population. Everywhere around the world cities were growing, but here the weavers, artisans and merchants were thrown out of work and forced to flee into the countryside where of course there was no work for them either since traditionally Indian farmers, tenants owned their own land but the British came in and upset that also by creating a land settlement policy made to resemble what they recognized in England of a squirearchy where land was so called owned by big Zamindars, big landlords who in turn were responsible for maintaining the peace and giving taxes to the British. Um, so the result was the British not only destroyed the textile industry, they also imposed punitive taxes and duties on the export of those cloth that, 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 that still remained, what little remained of the textile industry. And they lifted duties and import, uh, taxes on the import of their cloth into India, which in any case was a captive market held at the point of a British gun. So that's how British cloth completely supplanted and destroyed Indian textiles. Another example is shipbuilding. Uh, we had some tremendous craftsmen who made great ships, Bengal, uh, the, the, the eastern Andhra coast, as well as the western coast under the Marathas. Indian ships made of mahogany and teak usually lasted 26, 27 years, whereas in the western world, ships made of fire, fur and pine rarely lasted more than six or seven years. So Indian ships are not sought after. And when the British had, of course, conquered some of these ports and some of these territories, they started making their own ships in India. So good was the craftsmanship. And I've quoted accounts of how good the craftsmanship was in English eyes. But what happened was that um, as the ships got made in India, it threw people out of work in London, the London dockyards soon filled up with unemployed shipwrights and fitters and other dock workers who were deeply discontented and the British Parliament passed a law that made it illegal for ships made in India to apply the lucrative international routes, especially to London, and that destroyed Indian shipping. Or take steel. We were world leaders in steel production. The Indian technology uh, was invented in today's Karnataka. It was called Fukka steel, but the Europeans could pronounce us, they called it wood steel, W-O-O-T-Z. And uh, the Arabs came and learned this technology from India to produce the famous Damascus steel. When the Europeans came to India, when the British started winning battles, they would kill Indian soldiers, dismount from their horses, and steal their swords, because the swords were made of so much better steel than anything available in Europe at the time. And again, they destroyed that industry. So one after the other, systematic destruction of Indian industry and the replacement by British manufacture, British exports, British goods, was a feature of the British conquest. There was rapacious taxation at much higher levels than had ever been known. But what was interesting about Indian taxation, even when it was cruel, as sometimes all taxation tends to be, it was done humanely, so that if, for example, the peasant had a drought that year, or there was a death in the family, or even a marriage in the family, the taxes were waived or reduced. There was a kind of human relationship between the tax collector and the taxpayer. But the British believed in doing everything by the rule book. For them, the tax was paid. It didn't matter what the circumstances were. It had to be paid. The means of exacting the tax was quite severe. Uh, it was often, it often involved public humiliation, flogging, torture, and so on. And people couldn't pay the taxes. Peasants started fleeing British controlled lands into India you know, in order to escape this kind of torture. And what was done with this tax was, even if in the past they been exploitative taxation, at least it was spent in India, including on building bridges and roads and serais and so on. Here the taxes were all sent off to England. So you had the ruthless exploitation of the Indian peasants, sometimes the taxes amounting to 95% of the value of the crop for the benefit of a foreign country far away. And the drainage of resources, meticulously cataloged, because the British are very good at keeping the cuts, um, gave us a, a, a sad story of profound exploitation where all the investable surplus of the entire country, instead of being invested in the improvement of the country, was sent off to build up England and, and ensure the prosperity of Britain and indeed help finance the Industrial Revolution. 
and you had people coming and, and robbing you. Quite literally, I mean, they took the word loot, the Hindi word, into their dictionaries as well as their hands. And they, they, they looted left, right, and center. Clive would walk into the treasuries of the people he conquered and literally help himself with everything he and his aides could carry. And then he publicly marveled at not showing, uh, at not stealing even more than he could have. He said, it's such self-restraint, you ought to be thanked and congratulated. Uh, and the British called him Clive of India as if he belonged to the country. And all he really did was ensure that much of the riches of the country belonged to him. Anyway, uh, this was the, the saga. You had a man called Thomas Pitt, for example, governor of Madras in 1702, who went back with a diamond so enormous that when he sold it to the Duke d'Orléans for 23 million pounds, he had enough money to make himself one of the richest men in England, bought a huge manor in the countryside, bought himself a seat in Parliament, and founded a political dynasty that later in the 18th century gave the British two prime ministers. William Pitt the Elder, the Earl of Chatham, and William Pitt the Younger. Descendants of Thomas Pitt or Indian money, if you like. Uh, similarly, there's a wonderful letter I quote from a young man serving in the East India Company in the early 18th century, writing to his father and saying that the best place in the world for a mediocre Englishman of no particular talent and ability to make a fortune is India. And that was exactly what, what, uh, what we saw happen. Now, I haven't even gone in and touched on some of the other uh, terrible things they did. The famines, 35 million Indians died in wholly unnecessary famines because of British policy. There were droughts in India before, but there weren't famines because Indians had a culture of charity. First of all, in Indian culture, we were so used to sadhus and mendicants and monks and so on going from door to door with their bowl expecting to be fed for free so they could concentrate on their spiritual uh, reflections on their, their meditation. It was so part of our culture we all fed them, right? This was how it worked. The British were horrified by this. They said, you're encouraging idleness. This is indiscriminate arms giving. The British tried to ban it. When droughts occurred and people were starving, the British reaction was a compound of four principles. Opposition to, to indiscriminate arms giving. Insistence on the market. That is, they said, we are going to procure grain in India to ship off to the bread baskets in London. If as a result, in a drought with a shortage of grain, prices go up and people can't afford to buy the grain they start, too bad, that's the laws of the market. Third principle was the Malthusian one. That if the land cannot sustain the population that's trying to live off it, then people must die. That's how the population balance is corrected, Malthus's theory. And they believed it very firmly and passionately. So they said, let people die, it's the law of nature. And then the fourth principle was fiscal prudence, very English. Thou shalt not spend money thou hast not budgeted for. And of course they never budgeted for famines. So the result was in famines people died, quite simply. The first famine under British rule was a complete shocker to the Indians because they'd never seen anything like this between 1770 and 1776. One third of the entire population of Bengal died of starvation because of uh, the British policy. The British, by the way, weren't only being racist. They did the same thing in Ireland. And in Ireland in the 1840s, when the big potato fight struck, Irish people died because the British did exactly the same sets of principles there, applied them there. Of course, many Irishmen just got on boats and went off to America, but Indians didn't have that option. So Indians just died. And that began under the British in 1770, carried on right up to the Second World War. You all know about the Great Bengal Famine, in which 4.3 million people died because of British policy and explicitly because of the decisions of a particularly evil figure from 20th century history, Winston Churchill. Churchill deliberately decided that grain would be exported from starving Bengal, as he put it to feed sturdy. He said the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis, any way underfed Bengalis matters less than the food of sturdy Tommies, quote unquote. But the sturdy Tommies weren't getting the grain. The grain was going into bolster buffer stocks which were being held in reserve for a possible future invasion of Yugoslavia and Greece, which in fact never happened to late 1944. But in the meantime, people were actually dying in Churchill, didn't care. The result was that literally people were dying on the streets. Ships laden with wheat were calling in Calcutta port from Australia. The local officials wanted them to, 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 to disembark their grain. 
Churchill personally decided that they would not, that they would sail on to Europe with their grain. When people died, they wrote to me, said, these Indians, it's all their fault anyway for breathing like rabbits. They are a beastly people. He said, I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. Let them die. This was the kind of language the man used. And when conscience stricken British officials sent him an official report about the colossal number of deaths being caused by his decisions, all he could do was to bring him, all he could bring himself to do was to write feverishly in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? And this is the man the British expect us to hail as some sort of apostle of freedom and democracy. Um, but anyway, we, we can swallow our outrage for now. Uh, this was the, the kind of experience that we had. Now, I've, I've left off a lot of other atrocities, massacres, the use of indentured labor, and so on. If you interest any of that, I'm happy to talk about it. It's all in the book. Let me quickly come to the second half of the argument uh, as, to, as to what exactly uh, the British claim they did for us, right? So they talk about having given India uh, its political unity. That's absurd. The idea of Indian unity precedes the British by a couple of millennia. In fact, one could, if you really want to, you go back to the Rig Veda, which talks about Bharat Varsha as the land between the mountains and the seas. Um, and, but it wasn't just that. I mean, look at Chandragupta Maurya and Ashoka in the third century before Christ, trying to unite the whole territory of the Indian subcontinent, of course, including in Pakistan and Afghanistan, into one territorial space because they saw it as such. And every monarch subsequently who had the power tried to do the same thing, very few succeeded until the Mughals were able to unite about 95% of the country. So before the British, you had seen the political territory of unity of India. There was also the civilizational unity. Adi Shankara from my state of Kerala, traveling the length and breadth of the subcontinent, establishing his monks in Srinagar, in Kashmir, in Dwarka, in Gujarat, in Puri, in Orisha, and of course in the south, in Kanji, Purim, and elsewhere. And this is what the Harvard scholar Diana Heck describes as the sacred geography of India, knit together by countless tracts of pilgrimage. But if you think that's purely a Hindu idea, no, because Maulana Azad has written about how Indian Muslims traveling to Mecca for the Hajj were received by other Muslims, particularly by the Arabs, as all being from one part of the world, from Hind. They were all called Hindi, whether they were Pathans from the Northwest or Tamils from the Southeast. So the world saw India as one entity, it was no gift of the British. In fact, the British can be blamed for the opposite, which is the destruction of the political unity of India through their systematic policy of divide and rule. Because when the Indians revolted against the British in 1857, what they dismissively called the Sepoy Mutiny, they were horrified to see Hindus and Muslims fighting side by side and under each other's command against the hated foreign oppressor. So they said this must not be allowed to happen again. Lord Elphinstone wrote a celebrated memo where he said, Divide et impera was the ancient Roman maxim and shall be ours. Divide et impera, Latin for divide and rule. And they proceeded as a systematic policy to divide India on religious grounds. The active encouragement of a separate sense of consciousness amongst the Muslim community was a direct result of British policy. It had never existed before, even when we had Mughal monarchs who were accused of persecuting Hindus, they had Hindu generals fighting on their side. And when you had someone like Shivaji who is hailed today as some sort of Hindu resisting, Hindu warrior resisting the, the Mughals, he had Muslim artillery captains and, and officers fighting under him. There was never a monolithic sense of separation at all between the communities until the British sought actively to create it. And they did, did successfully create it, and I can go into much more detail, but I'm conscious of the time, so in order to leave time for Q&A, if you want to know more about this, it's in the book and I'm very happy to answer it in more detail. But their divide and rule policy, deliberately, systematically carried out, culminated in the tragic horrors of partition. So, no credit for political unity. As for rule of law, the British claimed to have brought rule of law to India, but in fact they administered it with excessive attention to the skin color of the defendant. So in 300 years of British rule, you can only find three cases in which a white man was convicted and executed for murdering an Indian. All of these cases were egregious ones. But there are hundreds of cases recorded of Englishmen killing Indians and getting away with it, either completely with impunity or with a token fine, a couple of days in the cooler. One very common uh, episode, very common, was an Englishman kicking his Indian domestic servant to death. 
with his boots on. And uh, the killings were justified or rationalized. The entire theory was created that, uh, you see, all these Indians are very malarial, so they have enlarged spleens. And the servant really died from a ruptured spleen. Yes, the king ruptured the spleen, but it wasn't, it wasn't a murder. It was just a king, but the, the Indian died, therefore the Englishman should not be punished. This was the kind of logic, this was the kind of rule of law the British gave us. They would not allow Indian judges to sit in judgment on British defendants, and so on and so forth. I've gone in considerable detail on the double standards of sought to apply. So once again, it was a, a completely hypocritical rule of law they brought in. They talk about the railways, that's another favorite subject. We gave you the railways. They brought in the railways purely for their own benefit, their own profit, and to exercise their own control. That is, they wanted a means of extracting resources from the hinterland, bringing them to the ports and sending them off to Britain. That's why the railways were built. And it was also a means of sending troops into the interior of the country to be able to quell any unrest. So that's why the railways were built. And they were built completely at Indian expense. Every penny was paid for by Indian taxpayers. And paid for so lavishly because the British insisted on a guaranteed rate of interest for its investors that made the Indian railways the single most profitable investment on the London Stock Exchange between the mid-1840s and the mid-1870s. You got guaranteed double the highest rates possible in any British government security. So the British were only too happy to invest and of course the Indian taxpayer was paying for it. It was described at the time as private profit and public risk. Except the public risk was all Indian and the private profit was all British. When they, they added passenger wagons and so on, because obviously these trains coming through the country, there were Indians who wanted to take them. Third class carriages with wooden slats for benches and so on. What they, what they do, they uh, made Indians pay the highest passenger rates of any railway in the world. But British companies paid the lowest freight rates of any companies in the world to ship freight on their railway. It was only after independence that we turned the logic of all this around and made the railways an instrument for the convenience principally of the Indian passenger. And indeed now our freight rates are so high that Indian businessmen are shipping more goods on lorries are already congested highways, so we may have gone too far. But just to say that the British railway policy was not intended to benefit us. And I've also talked about the extreme racism with which the entire exercise was run. And so it goes, but I, I do want to leave time for a meaningful Q&A with you. So I, I just basically go through the whole list, which includes the English language, tea, cricket, and so on, and I demonstrate how every one of these things was brought in only for the convenience of the rulers and not of the ruled. So at the end of the day, looking back on this, on this exercise, you may well say, what's the point? What do you want out of it? Isn't this all hat? The British left 70 years ago, who cares anymore, etc. And, and these are legitimate questions, I'm sure, in the 21st century. What I say to young people, particularly in India, is that just as you're bound to be a bit curious about your parents and your grandparents, where they came from, who they are, you as a society, as a civilization, should have some sense of what happened to your country just a few hundred years ago. Because the truth is that if you don't know where you've come from, how will you appreciate where you're going? At the same time, I'm not trying to insist that this should in any way color our relationship today and tomorrow with Britain. On the contrary, today's relationship is between two sovereign equal countries. The British, as far as I'm concerned, are a country, an economy of the same size as ours, a country much smaller than ours in terms of weight, population, and so on. We don't have to look at Britain with a chip on our shoulder. In fact, the Indian attitude has been one of forgive and forget. Uh, Nehru, in an anecdote that I recall, which might be apocryphal, uh, so it was asked by Churchill, why is it that after how we treated you and you, sp we sp you spent 10 years of your life in British jails, how is it that you don't bear us any bitterness or rancor? And Jack Nehru is said to have replied, I was taught by a great man, Mahatma Gandhi, never to fear and never to hate. So that's very laudable. And, and uh, whereas Mahatma Gandhi had this very Hindu idea, he a Hindu viceroy saying that the British Empire in India is a sin. But he also had a very Hindu idea that you must hate the sin and not the sinner. So the moment the sin is over, then there is nothing left to hate. There is no one left to hate. And that is in many ways a very healthy idea. 
His hatred is a profoundly negative emotion which corrodes the soul of the hater much more than the hated. And therefore, we should, we should definitely forgive. But forgive and forget is wrong. It's the forget part that is wrong. I want Indians to forgive, but I don't want us to forget. I want us to remember. I have called, for example, for the Victoria Memorial in Calcutta to be converted into a museum of colonialism to remind school children and others of what exactly happened for 200 years when the people who built that memorial were ruling us. I've also pointed out to the British that they have no memorial of colonialism either in England, despite the fact that most of the topography of London today is unthinkable without colonial money, not just from India, which was vast enough, but from the sugar plantations of the Caribbean and many of the colonies in Africa and so on. So the British did well out of having an empire, but they don't realize how much bad they did as well. And there are polls amongst young Britons that show you a startlingly high percentage of young Britons who are claiming to be proud of their empire and they want it back, but they don't know what they're proud of. And I think that they need to be taught because the, the week my book came out in India, there was an essay by a Pakistani journalist of The Guardian saying she had, two raised, she had raised two children in London, put them into uh, one of the most uh, prestigious public schools in London. They had done their A-levels in history and they had not learned a word of colonial history. Now this kind of convenient historical amnesia, brushing all this under the carpet, is unforgivable. And the British need to face up to the truth of, uh, of what they have actually done. And the final thing that I would say that I would want from all of this is an apology. The perfect occasion is coming up. On the 13th of April 2019, we will see the centenary of what I consider the single worst atrocity of the British Raj in India. Not in terms of numbers of deaths, because certainly there are many, many other examples. In fact, 100,000 people were butchered by the British in Delhi alone in 1858. But rather, because of everything that involved, this is, I'm referring, as you've all guessed, to the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, the Amritsar massacre. What happened was that it followed a betrayal of promises by the British. India had supported Britain in the First World War, even Mahatma Gandhi had called for support to the British, principally because it was meant to be an exchange for responsible self-government in India, what we assume would be the kind of dominion status that the white Commonwealth countries had enjoyed. And in order to come in and have that opportunity, um, we had support of the British. 1.3 million Indians fought under arms for the British in the, in the First World War. More than 80,000 were killed, another 80,000 seriously maimed and wounded for life. Very, very serious uh, military contribution. But in addition to that, we give large sums of money, taxpayers' money as well as from the treasuries of the Maharajas. We give food, we give medicines, we give clothing and uniforms, carts, vehicles, pack animals. Even rail lines were ripped out of the ground and sent off to aid the war effort. The sum total of India's assistance to Britain in the First World War is measured in today's money at 80 billion pounds sterling. That's about 100 million dollars. So this is, the British couldn't have fought the war without us. And at the end of it, of course, the Phineas Albion broke its word, betrayed its promises, and not only did it not give responsible self-government, it actually reimposed the repressive wartime era restrictions on freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, expression, and so on. Inevitably, protests broke out, people started speaking out against the British, and to clamp down on the unrest, the British essentially declared martial law. So they sent a general, General Dyer, to the town of Amritsar to keep the peace there. He heard about a large number of people gathered in a walled garden, Jaliyamwala Bagh. It actually happened to be the Punjabi's festival, spring festival of Baisakhi. So a lot of these were peasant, peasants who had no real idea that they weren't allowed to be there, but they all gathered in this garden mainly to celebrate Baisakhi as a holiday and also, of course, to perhaps listen to a few speeches against the British, but they were unarmed defenseless. They were not there to riot. They were there to celebrate Baisakhi. Dyer arrived with his troops. He didn't ask them why they were there. He didn't give them any warning to disperse. He didn't even fire a warning shot. He just ordered the soldiers to fire directly, clinically, into the unarmed, defenseless, shrieking crowd, mainly of women and children, not just men. As they rushed screaming to the exit, there's only one exit, one gate, 
He stationed the soldiers there so that the civilians would make for easier targets. And as he shot and killed them, he expressed satisfaction later that practically no bullet was wasted. The British admitted to 379 killed in 15 minutes. The Indians claim it was over a thousand, probably somewhere between the two numbers. Uh, a further thousand of Brutus Indian, but worse was to follow. Dyer sealed the gate and would not let anybody attend to the dead, the dying, and the wounded. For 24 hours they laid that hot cape from the sun, baking, crying, wailing out, while their relatives could not even give them a drop of water. Dyer made Indians crawl on the street on their bellies so that if they so much as lifted their head, the head would be bashed in by British staves, poked with bayonets. That was what was happening, the humiliations. And at the end of all this, when there was naturally a public outcry, and an official commission of inquiry tried to exonerate him or whitewash his crimes, the House of Commons condemned his behavior. The House of Lords passed a resolution praising him for what he had done. And that flatulent voice of Victorian imperialism, Rudyard Kipling, hailed him as the man who had saved India. Saved India for whom and for what is another matter. At the end of all of this, the British raised a collection for Dyer. The equivalent of today's money of a quarter of a million pounds sterling was given to him with a bejeweled sword. This is the, the legacy. So if you take the whole package as it were, the betrayal, the brutality, the indifference to the Indian suffering after the brutality, the racism and self-justification and celebration and congratulation of evil, when you take that whole thing together, you can understand why I consider this the single worst atrocity of the Raj. And therefore, if on the centenary of that occasion, a member of the royal family, because everything was done in the name of the crown, would come to Amritsar, go down and bend a knee perhaps, and express remorse and contrition for what was done. On that occasion, and by extension for all the wrongs that were done, what a wonderfully cleansing effect that would have, and what an example it would set for the Indo-British relationship. I don't know if it will happen. Many people, of course, say, well, you know, some people to say to me, well, if we apologize to you, we'll have, apolog we have to apologize in 130 countries when I'm going to start off. And others who say, uh, you know, why now? There's no one alive who's worth apologizing to. All the victims are dead. And besides, none of us did any of these horrible acts of white they must today. I'll just give two examples and then I'll end. One is um, with Willy Brandt, the German Chancellor in 1970, falling on his knees at the Warsaw Ghetto to apologize to the Polish people on behalf of the Germans for the atrocities committed by the Nazis on the Polish Jews. What's striking is that Brandt was a social democrat. He was completely innocent of any taint of wrongdoing. Indeed, social democrats like him were persecuted by the Nazis. But still, as head of the German government, he felt he needed to apologize on behalf of his people for the collective wrongdoing. And the other examples from last year, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, apologizing in the Canadian Parliament to India for the Komagata Maru incident. The Komagata Maru was a Japanese ship laden with Indian refugees, which was turned away from Vancouver port at the point of the gun, uh, ordered not to disembark, and most of the people on that ship met her rather grisly in their British hands or on the high seas. And the result was a, a feeling of guilt on the part of the Canadians that they had not given refuge to these people and had essentially turned them away to their deaths. They didn't directly kill anybody the way Dyer killed people in Amritsa, but this nonetheless is something that Trudeau felt he should apologize for. So, there are good precedents. There's no reason why the British shouldn't apologize. If they did, they might be able to close this chapter more successfully. If not, I hope that this book will continue to be read and that somebody's blood may boil over some years later to exact this result, this form of atonement that alone, I think, will close the chapter for all of us. Thank you very much. I'll take you This has been a wonderful, wonderful um, event. So um, tell us um, your part in this and what it's called again. Yeah. Uh, so this fest, uh, this uh, event is called Sanskriti. It's a uh, book is, is it's a writers as well as artist exhibit so there's a few artists here and I'm one of them and um, my art um, as you can see there's a lot of uh, colors very vibrant and uh, 
and my art, I'm inspired by art from uh, folk art from all around the world, art culture and uh, uh, everything from primitive art from around the world. So I do everything from my mind, whatever intuitively comes out. And um, so I've got abstracts and I've got women. Women are beautiful and uh, I love to adorn them in beautiful costumes and colors. There's uh, you can, it's up to you to, to interpret if where they're from, they're just from my mind and I create them and uh, so that's about it. Is this acrylic? Yes, it's acrylic on canvas. Yeah. And I, I, I like your little boxes, yeah. that's a really neat idea there. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about them. So they, they're pre-made canvas, so I just painted on them and then you don't need anything to wire or anything and you can just put it on uh, you can make it put it in a row on the wall it's just good by itself yeah i love it where do you sell this so i sell on etsy and then i have a little um my home is like my um gallery so it's got painting all over i live in andover and uh, i'm uh, i sell from there and i i also exhibit in different locations whenever i get an opportunity yeah. Yeah. art fairs and so on yes. so, you know yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, Newburyport Art Association and then Andover Art Council and all these things, yeah. Good to know. Yeah, good to know. Well, now where are you from originally? Right? I'm from India, yeah. yeah. So from a small town in India and uh, which is was very rich in tribal, uh, like primitive um, art and culture, so I guess. And then I traveled to Canada, to Bangkok to uh, now in US and then so all the I think it, everything plays a role in my art I thought I saw some African influence yes. yeah. so I'm yet to go to Africa but I that's like a dream wow. and uh, South America so I think all all those different places that I've uh, hopped on to has probably added some element to my art yeah are you doing this full time uh, yes and I'm also a yoga teacher and a photographer right. How long have you been um, uh, a photographer? So I started photography when I moved to France. And I moved to France maybe in fourth grade. And when I moved to France, I um, my family liked to take us to travel everywhere. So I've, I've traveled a lot in Europe. And once I was traveling a lot in Europe, I I saw so many, I loved, I, I saw everything. And I loved to just take pictures. And I was so inspired by the different cultures and the different people there. And I just started to take pictures. How long did you live in France? I lived in France for four years and then I moved here and um, it's been a great experience and it's really opened my eyes. One of my photos here is this black and white portrait and I took it of my friend. I adjusted the shutter speed so that you can take, you can capture the specific moment and um, it's, just, it's just water and I, I love it a lot. Um, some of my other pictures, I, I recently went to Rwanda, Africa and some of these pictures I just um, I, I, take, I took of the village people there and just all their natural expressions and how and just it's just amazing meeting all these children. I just have a few. Oops. And then one of them, we actually, um, one of the experiences I had is that we gave um, we gave newer soccer balls to all these children. This is just the this is what they usually play with. They play with balls that they make, they play with tops that they spin, and they play with tire rings, and they just use all the toys. So we went, um, we went hiking, and we just gave a bunch of soccer balls to them, and it was just a great experience to see them play with all these balls. I have a website. It's called timelessdays.wordpress.com, and I also have a social media page on Instagram called Seafoam Shores, but I will just be around in local things, and you can just look at all my photos.